and we're going ahead and recording it. Now, first thing we got to do, guys, in the chat box, if y'all can see it, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. I didn't need it. I didn't. I took it off. How do you, how do you get to be able to, for you to see someone? Um, is that Mason Price? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can see you, sir. Oh, okay, okay. thank you. Yes, sir. All right, in the chat box, guys, I'm just typing a message. It says, uh, please type your name, license number, your county, state, and phone number. That way, Laura can actually record it. Um, Zoom will automatically go ahead and do this for us, but we like having it in there uh, a second time. And so I see uh, Mr. Burkhart's already done that. Thank you, sir. I don't see nothing about the chat box. Oh, all right, we are. Yeah, Eric, I don't see anything. All right, do you, do you guys... Uh, you guys see like a bar very similar to what's on the screen share that says more and then you can see the chat box up top. Y'all's might look a little bit different. But there should be like a navigation bar at the very bottom. Mine says, uh, mine says more chat three webinar settings. Do you, you do see where it says chat? Yeah, chat three. Okay, okay, click on that. Okay. And do you guys see the the slide entitled Shade Tree Pests, Insects, and Mites as Pests of Ornamental Plants? No. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, good deal. I think that's about everybody that's got in. So thank you guys for joining Tuesday evening. We do these every Tuesday night. We didn't do one last week, but uh, we're going to do them every Tuesday night through the month of September. As our license, we got until um, September 30th to renew our pesticide license. Well, to get our CEUs in, they give us the uh, three month extension due to COVID. Yeah. So, all right, guys, well, we're going to go ahead and jump in on this. Yeah, Dylan. Sir? That's not you. That's just. Like I was going to make sure that I was on Jeff Bullock. Oh, okay. Yep. I hear okay. you, Jeff. All right. All right. Thanks. Yes, sir. Now. Eric, are you able to see where I signed in? Um, who's, I didn't, let's see, who's talking? Uh, Shane Grubbs. Yeah, 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 I see your face and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing where you uh, put your uh, license number and everything. Cool. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if I'm logged in, if you can see me or not. Yep, yeah. I can see you. Did you get mine, Mason Price? Logged in? Uh, Mr. Price, I see your face on the screen, and let's see, I see you there in the chat box. You're good to go. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I know we got some, we got some out of staters on here. Uh, if you're, and a lot of you guys may have multiple licenses. You might like live in Charlotte and work both in North Carolina and South Carolina. So make sure if you've got dual license that you'll, uh, you know, put both of them on there so you'll get credit. In South Carolina as well. So this uh, this class was approved in seven seven different states. So all right. And the way this has worked, we've got uh, we've got a slide deck. It's about sixty seven slides long, and we'll talk until about six fifty, and then we'll take a ten minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll finish the second half. And uh, a lot of this. <laughs> time flies when you guys are interactive and we're talking back and forth that makes it fun that you know helps all of us learn a little bit each time when we hear um everybody 
you know, everybody speaking about what they're seeing in the field because, you know, I mean, it's, you know, there's weeds everywhere. There's weeds in our turf grasses. There's weeds in our shrub beds now. I mean, we're, we're fighting it and we're going to continue to fight it. So, I mean, we've, we've had the, the perfect season for weeds. We've had the rain, we've had the heat. <laughs> so just one of those, one of those years, Mr. Daniels. Yes, sir. You're good. I can see you. I can see you in the chat box. Uh, I can only see a few, a few of you's faces right now, unless I scroll through. Yep, I'm seeing everybody. So, some familiar faces, so appreciate the seeing you guys again. And if you're new here, thank you for joining. Um, it goes by fast, man. This is like a quick two hours, so I uh, I really enjoy it, and I uh, thank you all for uh, for being here. And it's like I said, be interactive. Let's have some fun. And uh, let's talk some weeds and talk some bugs of our uh, of our shrubs that we're seeing. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Shade tree pests, insects and mites as pests of ornamental plants. And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, we're gonna go ahead and we'll mute everybody. And if you want to speak, uh, just kind of unmute. You'll see the unmute button uh, there on your screen. And once you, uh, if you want to talk, just kind of unclick the, the mute button and then uh, um, give us your take, your, uh, your opinions. So. Hey. All right, so our objectives uh, of this course, we are uh, going to be able to tell the difference between damage that is caused by chewing insects and then damage that is caused by the sucking or piercing insects. We will be able to uh, recognize characteristic signs of damage caused by common pests of our landscape plants. We will recognize the, uh, the most common pests of the landscape. We will list three alternatives to synthetic insecticides. And then we will name pests that might be controlled by the BT in the caterpillar stage. And then we will name the pests that might be controlled by horticulture oils and insecticidal soaps. But first of all, how many of you guys are actively involved in tree and shrub care? Or are you mainly devoted your company to the turf care industry? Is there anybody out there actively doing it every single day, spraying shrubs, trees, and taking care of that? If so, let us know. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the weeds? What are some of the problems? Not only the disease, but weeds, insects. What are we seeing out there now in our shrubs? What are some of the stuff we're actually seeing in our turf grasses right now? We've had the hot summer. We've had the rain. So is there anything in particular that you guys are seeing where you're located that's maybe more dominant this year? We're more active than it was last year just because of the the rain and the heat that we've had? Carpet grass, I think that was the main thing I have seen in one of the customers I had. The carpet grass. Where are you mm -hmm. from? Well, I was born in Panama. I live oh, okay. in North Carolina for but yeah, but yeah, like years. where where do you do most of your uh your uh well east the east um uh, I'm working uh, well residential, you know, in the eastern uh, part of uh, North Carolina. Okay. Greenville area. Greenville. Okay. Gotcha. Mainly doing lawn care apps or? or uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'm mainly lawn care. Good deal. Good deal. Anybody else out there more, seeing some nasty more, stuff? More nut sedge than we've ever seen before. Yes. And what are you spraying for nut sedge? Uh, Q4 and sedge hammer. Okay. Expensive stuff. But yeah. It's working, isn't it? It is, but every year it seems to be getting worse and worse. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're seeing it in your turf grass, but you're also seeing it in your shrub beds too, aren't you? Correct. Yep. Yep. So how much is that Q4 right offhand, you know? Q4, it's about a 
hundred and forty for a a gallon jug. Hundred and forty for a gallon jug. Yep. Yep. And the uh, sedgehammer product, it's a little bottle that's like a hundred and ten. Gotcha. Yeah, a little, little almost like a little pill bottle, ain't it? Correct. Yep. Anybody remember anybody ever use Bassagram or anything like that in the old days? That was a good stuff that uh, that we'd use on some of these uh, turf grass weeds. But yes, sedge is a lot, a big problem because it likes the heat, because it likes the water. All right, so our pesticides. Um, know when a pest is present. You need to know when it's most susceptible to the control. And remember that pesticides may not work on all stages. And what is the number one reason that we have pesticide failures? When we go to make an application and we don't do our job, what do you think the number one reason we have a pesticide failure is? has a lot to do with that first statement. Know when a pest is present, but what's the one thing we need to take out of that statement itself? What's the first thing that we have to do? And it may not be such an issue when it comes to a weed, but definitely when it comes to like a fungus or it comes to an insect, probably more so with an insect than anything else. What's the first thing that we have to do to prevent that pesticide failure? Well, we have to properly identify the pest. That is the number one reason we have pesticide failures is that we incorrectly identify the pest. We identify a situation or determine that there's a situation that may not necessarily be caused by the insect that we think is causing the damage. It could be something totally different. So how do, we, how do we actually take care of that situation? What do we have to do before we apply these pesticides for our clients? Because you guys are just talking about how expensive some of these chemicals are. So what's the first thing we have to do when it comes to identifying these issues? We're gonna have to make a site visit. We're gonna have to be on our customer's properties. And what process of that, what is that process term? We talk about this in a lot of the other classes. We talk about integrated pest management or IPM. We're scouting, we're looking, we're trying to see what's going on in our customers' lawns, in our customers' landscapes. Now, it may be hard if we're not the operator that's there doing it, depending on what size you are. If you're a you know, small company and you're doing most of the pesticide applications, you're the one that's watching everything that's going on. And it's easy to identify it. You guys are the licensed professionals, so you know what you're talking about. But if you've hired someone new and they've just recently become certified or whatever, they may not know from experience what's going on. But you got to know what's going on there. And then once you correctly identify, especially the insect, what stage, what life stage is the insect in? And some of these insects may have multiple generations in one year so we've got to we've got to figure it out we've got to be on site um, growth regulators they can prevent pets from hatching or even malting properly they also um, you know will prevent that second generation from coming around so it's very very important that you time that application to make it correctly when we use our horticulture oils and insecticidal soaps, they are going to coat the pest and kill it. They're going to prevent it from breathing. They're going to, you know, put that, uh, they're going to prevent it from flying or whatever it is that they're doing, but it's going to do it. That works well in an integrated pest management plan. Your homeowners, your customers, they're going to like the fact that you're not using a pesticide, um, you know, every time. So if you can use one of these oils or the soaps, you, uh, you're better off. We get a lot of criti you know, criticism in the green industry for applying too much pesticides. You know, people think we're just going to 
you know, go out and spray everything, kill it, kill it all at once. But no, we're not. We're not going to do that. We should implement an IPM. Is anybody out there implementing an integrated pest management plan or writing these plans for their customers? or actually looked into doing it because, you know, there's already, there's a ton of plans out there on the internet that you can find and start implementing this stuff. And it's definitely worthwhile taking a look at for our trees and shrubs. Lawn care, yes, I mean, we're still going to have to spray a lot of stuff when it comes to it. But the idea, if you have somebody on a lawn care program, the following years is going to be a little bit better. It's not going to be so such a bad lawn. If they if they, if you have a customer on a lawn care program within one year, you should have them looking pretty pretty uh, pretty darn good, and that you may not have to use as many pesticides the following year. All right. So our chewing insects, the azalea caterpillar. Uh, it's going to feed on azaleas. It's going to molt into these little purple striped caterpillars, little cute little things. They can lay up to 100 eggs in the masses, and they usually uh, will completely defoliate one stem or an area. The Bacillus thur thuringianus, always have trouble saying that, but our BT should give adequate control on the younger caterpillars. With our Jap beetles, they're gonna attack the foliage and defoliate the plants they're going to have that copper and green in color and prefer damp soils. When did the Japanese beetles start popping out? When did they start popping out of the ground? When did you guys start seeing them? Was it earlier this year or anything because of the weather? Or when should we see them? Start seeing them in what? The end of June, 1st of July? Especially going to see them on our... Uh, a lot on our roses, a lot of our shrubs. These are nasty little things. Are those Japanese beetles in Florida? Uh, I'm sure you guys have them, especially probably up in northern Florida. What part are you from, Florida? Uh, I'm from southern Florida, West Palm. West Palm, okay. Okay, cool. We were down there um, back in February for the um, Sports Managers Turf Association. That okay. was first time being down there, but yeah, we were in West Palm Beach for that. And uh, awesome. I'm a part of Turf Up Radio. They're uh, based out of Fort Lauderdale. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. But a good area, man. I liked Florida. <laughs> the chewing insects again, eastern tent caterpillars, brown, uh, brownish, reddish with uh, two pale lines on each wing. They lay eggs in the masses, can completely defoliate small trees, uh, but can be controlled with BT. Fall webworms, you know, not long before that's going to start appearing. Spins yeah. a webbing over the leaves at the tips of the branches and feeds within the web. The small trees can become entirely webbed, uh, but can be controlled by BT. Bagworms, uh, they can cause excessive defoliation and may kill the arborvitaes and Leland cypress, usually within one to two seasons. Removed by hand or BT can control it. And we actually had two blue atlas cedars on campus in the past two years, completely killed uh, by the bagworms. Uh, our maintenance guys, I mean, they were, you know, struggling with that. And it just, it, it got too late. We lost both of them. They were beautiful trees, beautiful trees. But the bagworms, you got them. And then we go fishing at a lake here on the farm. And we got some willow oaks kind of around the lake, covered in bagworms the past few weeks. So... Nasty little guys. You just got to pull them off. Wood boring. We got the southern pine beetle. They can transmit a blue stain fungus uh, that'll block water transport. It'll kill the tree and then degrades lumber and kill up to several hundred acres of pines. So you know, you know your forestry people are all about getting rid of this little guy. Uh, the only thing you can do is cut down the infected trees and then protect the healthy trees with insecticides. You got the Asian uh, ambrosia beetle. It bores into the sap and heartwood of the trees and shrubs, and the large numbers will kill branches in the trees. Do not overwater the trees and contact the local extension office for control methods uh, in your area. 
Sucking pest. Aphids. Fun little creatures. They will suck the phloem, which is kind of like I always talk about phloem and xylem uh, in the plants, a plant science thing. The phloem is kind of like almost like your blood vessels that we have in here. The phloem is carrying the food and water throughout the plant. Uh, but they'll suck the phloem from herbaceous plant stems and the leaves. Uh, they can distort future growth. And they'll excrete a honeydew that attracts other insects and can cause sooty mold to grow. And that honeydew can also be a problem on cars. If it drips on it, if it drips on sidewalks, people can walk through it and slip on it. So if you're looking after commercial properties, this is something that you would want to uh, educate the property manager on if there is a situation with aphids, because I know a lot of Property managers, they don't want to spend the extra money on something like that. They just kind of see if nature will take care of it. But aphids can be a big problem. Um, the uh, There is a, was a situation. What Aphids, a cool thing. Let's talk about a cool thing about aphids. What is, what is probably the coolest thing about their reproduction? They're going to make sure that they have the next generation. But what is it that... What is it that the female aphid does not have to have? The male. The male, exactly, exactly. So they, they are gonna make sure that their next generation is going to continue. What's one of the best ways biologically to control aphids? You ever heard of the parasitic wasps? And you know how tiny an aphid is. I mean, there. I mean, you know, you could see aphids on a leaf. You know, maybe not myself now with old age setting in and, and needing reading glasses, but definitely you could tell that there's aphids there. But if you pick up and stick, you know, take that leaf and stick it under a microscope, there is a parasitic wasp that you can get. It's kind of going to be hard to use in the landscape because these guys are going to fly off. But if you had aphids in like a greenhouse or whatever, or in nature, if you see an aphid under the microscope and it has a little black hole in it, that means that it's been killed by a parasitic wasp. How would that parasitic wasp kill that aphid? They're going to drill that hole. They're going to lay its eggs inside the aphid. So that parasitic wasp dumps the eggs in the aphid. The aphid's still alive. What is that aphid doing for that parasitic wasp? It's providing shelter. And when those little wasps hatch out of their eggs, what do they have readily available? Stinger. Well, they'll have that, but what do they have readily available to them? They'll have a food source. They'll eat the aphid from the inside out. And so when you see when you see that aphid underneath the microscope, you're going to see that big big hole underneath it. And when do we have when do we have when do we have a bigger population of aphids? It's when the nitrogen levels are higher in the plant material. So it's going to be at spring leaf unfold, and then it's going to be in the fall. Well, what are we typically doing in the spring and fall, especially here where we're at? We're in the transition zone here in North Carolina, so we have more cool season grasses. But in the spring, we're fertilizing our fescue. In the fall, we're fertilizing our fescues. And we're always going to get, you know, some of that fertilized into the shrub beds, around the tree rings. So we're putting more nitrogen there in the soil for these plants to uptake, which is going to be more beneficial for the aphids because they need the nitrogen to grow. So they always say not to fertilize if you're having issues with aphids. Kind of a step in the IPM plan. But you're not going to be able to tell your customer you're not going to plug in seed and put out fertilized because it has some aphids. We'd probably make the, uh, the pesticide application. Where do the aphids like to hide out in? on a shrub or a tree. They like that new growth. They like the new growth. And so you're going to see them hang out where we've got sucker growth or we've got new foliage popping out on a tree. And so the easiest thing to do would be to prune that sucker growth or those water sprouts 
off the trees or the shrubs and kind of keep it clean for that. And you will, you will get rid of some of them. Armored scales, they're gonna leave, uh, the leaves will develop yellow spots uh, where the scales feed and can cause heavily infested leaves to drop. And they are susceptible to our horticulture oils. Spider mites. With our spider mites, they're gonna pierce the plant and they're gonna suck the flow of the plant. Our heavily infested plants can become yellow and die and the mites may completely web over the plant. The mites do most damage during the hot, dry weather. The mites are controlled by natural pests and horticulture oils. And so we haven't had so much dry weather this summer. So is anybody seeing any issues with spider mites out there? We haven't, we haven't really seen any. We've seen a few on campus in our greenhouses, but that's kind of an issue that we've taken care of with our horticulture oils. But we haven't seen any in our landscape business much this year. Gall makers, we got the boxweed leaf miner. These are heavily infested boxwoods. I mean, the heavily infested boxwoods will drop their leaves prematurely and become unsightly. The miners have uh, very few predators, and so we would need to apply synthetic pesticides to the soil in late winter for the best miner growth. So that kind of wraps up a little bit of our insects, and we're going to kind of jump into the weeds of ornamental plants. One of my favorite things to take care of because it's more visually damaging. But our objectives for this, we're going to describe cultural practices for ornamentals that will reduce weed problems. We're going to describe the ways that weed plants and seeds are introduced to plant beds. We're going to explain precautions to take when using herbicides in ornamental beds. And then we're going to explain the difference between selective and non-selective herbicides. And that's probably an, uh, a good review, easy review. Most of you guys know that. So what are, what are some ways that we can transport weeds from shrub bed to shrub bed? The most common practice is uh, when you cut with a mower, you bring that with a mower from oh, yeah. one place to another. Exactly, exactly. And so what should we do with that? How can we prevent that? Clean the mower or sharpen or, or clean the blades. Yeah, you know, basically, you know, take a backpack blower, try to blow as much of the seeds away uh, off of it. Maybe lift the deck up and kind of take the backpack and blow underneath it. Uh, if you do have access to water on site, maybe just spray it off. But, you know, that again, that takes time. Uh, the easiest thing to do is probably take the backpack blower. Um, but we're going to be busy. We're going to forget to do that. Our crews are going to forget uh, that they need to do that. It's just one of those things that, that it's going, it's going to happen. Uh, but if we have a management plan, a successful management program involves three steps, understanding weeds and their life cycle, preparing the site by eliminating perennial weeds and sedges before planting, and then using a combination of methods to maintain the site. Now, you guys that are mowing, are you having your mowing crews actually spray weeds in the shrub beds or are you having a separate crew do that separate crew separate crew i like that and tell us why you do that kyle just because i figure when three or four guys are on the property and somebody's spraying it'd be easy for somebody to walk through that area and track it around true so I just have one guy going by himself to spray beds and i feel like that way he's not going to walk through the stuff he just sprayed exactly Exactly. Good point. Good point. And it also eliminates a couple guys probably sitting in the truck, finishing, letting the guy finish up spraying. For sure. We've always seen that. You know, you finish mowing, you got the guy blowing off the sidewalks or whatever, and then they grab a backpack, you know, and if you got, if you have a four man crew, three man crew, they're out spraying the weeds and shrub beds, you got two or three guys sitting in the truck, and that's, you know, you're losing valuable man hours there. So I love the one person spray crew best way to do it plus like you said he's not tracking where he's been he knows where he's been you don't have to uh you don't have to worry about any of that 
Site prep, detecting perennial or detecting these perennial weeds and controlling them before planting. Uh, the weed control is difficult and costly once a planting bed is established. So some pre-emergence that we may want to put under. We may want to do a soil fumigation if the site is heavily infested with uh, the perennial broadleaf weeds or the sedges. I know we do um, some fumigation here on our farm when we do plastic culture. We will fumigate for weeds and especially fungus, and it takes care of it. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, to do that. We've got our fields. We do we do about two and a half acres of strawberries each year, and COVID has actually hurt us on that. Believe it or not, there's not been enough workers actually taking the cutting, so we're going to get plants probably three to four weeks later than usual. So it's gonna it's gonna see uh, it's gonna be funny and um, not funny, but it's gonna be. Uh, Kind of weird to see what's going to happen very shortly when we do order our plants. But fumigation, that is some crazy uh, stuff. You know, we used to apply a pesticide where we had to have two applicators dressed out, you know, head to, head to toe and Navex suit, having to have a self-contained breathing apparatus. You know, the individual that was out putting down the plastic and fumigating under it, um, would be out there in the field and we had to have a guy readily, you know, available in case something happened that he could go out and stop the application and then remove uh, the individual that uh, was exposed to it. So, but they've, uh, they've done away with those pesticides. That was years and years ago. And now it's a lot, uh, a lot safer with the stuff we're using. Almost kind of like a tear grass, a talon is what we've been using the past few years. But with soil fumigation, they are applied as a gas. Uh, they can be a solid or a liquid, and they will kill most organisms living in the soil. They are highly, highly toxic. And if they're going to kill living organisms, especially insecticides and stuff, they are going to be harmful to us. The so uh, soil should be cultivated six to eight inches, seven to ten days before the treatment, and then again immediately afterward. Uh, if we're not using plastic. Fall is the best time to fumigate because the soils are warm and it is easier to maintain proper moisture. And there may be a waiting period between fumigation and planting. You would need to uh, check the label uh, and follow those instructions. Label is the law. Site maintenance. You would want to apply a two to four inch layer of mulch to suppress the weeds. I like the higher depth of mulch, so I would always lean towards that four inches. This will deprive the, uh, the weed seeds of sunlight. It's gonna keep them uh, from germinating. When mulches are too fine, thick, or begin to decompose, they stay wet between rains, and then that can aid in weed germination. Considering, I don't like this, and you know, but it's in our textbooks but using a fabric mulch. What's your, what's y'all's opinions on using some type of landscape fabric? I don't like them. We use it underneath river rock, but that's about the only time. Yes, yes, exactly. Yep. We never use it under mulch because it decomposes and you get brand new weeds growing. Yep. I don't personally like it, but some customers, they want it. They actually request that. That you do and, uh, the, One of the problems that I have, you know, even if you tuck this in, in the soil, sometimes with the weed eater or the mower, you, you touch that and break that and you see, I mean, fabric all over and then you spend extra time cleaning, you know. Yeah, exactly. The, the yard. Yep. And a lot of the times if you're doing commercial landscape installation, you're going to see it in the specifications that you must put down a landscape fabric. And a lot of the times we may not even read those specifications. And when it comes time to do a final check off and with the site super and they're like, you know, where's your landscape plastic? Where's your uh, landscape fabric? Uh, weeds should be removed when they are young. Yes. But, you know, if the weed germinates, you know, a day or two after mowing and it's another week before you get back, you know, they've had a full week to grow. And some weeds can grow several inches in a week, especially our sedges. 
Herbicides, the use of herbicides will not result in a high quality in weed free landscape. If you're just using them alone. Our non-selected herbicides can damage desirable plants if the spray touches its foliage or bark. And what's another problem uh, with spraying this time of year, especially with our maintenance crews? And they're going out spraying, you know, late afternoons, they're on the last property. You know, it's the hottest part of the day around, you know, three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon, they're spraying. What could happen with that herbicide as we spray it? It'll get hot. My tongue won't go as far forward as it used to. It'll get hot. That's right. And what's it going to do if it gets hot? Burn up. It volatilizes. It volatile, volatilizes. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to just turn into a vapor. And those vapor fumes can actually burn those plants and actually damage them and actually kill them. Systemic herbicides will move within the plant and then kill the weeds over a period of a few days to a few weeks. Pre-emergent herbicides, the base of a weed control program used primarily to control annual grasses and broadleaf weeds, uh, controls weeds for two to four months and you would apply before the weeds have germinated. I love using, love using something like Snapshot. Uh, what are some other things very similar to that? before you pine needle or mulch is going ahead and put that out. And we actually put that in our tree and tree, uh, tree and shrub program. We will go out and apply a pre-emergent herbicide to all of our shrub beds, especially on our commercial accounts that we don't want to have to uh, do so much backpack spraying. And it works. Post-emergent, they have little residual soil activity. They're used to control perennial grasses and broadleaf weeds that cannot be controlled by your pre-emergent herbicides. They're applied after the weeds have germinated. Summer annual grass, sand spur, nasty stuff. Germinates in the spring, grows in the summer to early fall, and dies with the uh, first heavy frost. More of a problem in the sandy soils. You see a lot of it near the coast. Uh, pull by hand in smaller areas and then apply a mulch to suppress the germination. And then we can also use uh, pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, in the last few classes, of, we had a golf course superintendent and they had a big uh, issues with the sand spur. And they were looking at other ways to actually get rid of it. Summer perennial grasses, Bermuda, the creeping perennial. It's dormant in the winter, grows from rhizomes in spring. Landscape fabrics and mulch will help suppress it. Yeah, but it's still gonna come up. Hand pulling is not effective. And then this selective herbicides can be used to help control it in plant beds. Now, Bermuda grass is one that, you know, guys is not necessarily a pest all the time. If we love golf and we love football and baseball, we love playing on a healthy stand of Bermuda grass. But if we have a fescue lawn, that's the last thing we want to see start creeping in. Now, any of you guys actually have customers that have the cool season grasses and the warm season grasses? Like we're in that transition zone. So we have properties side by side where one of our customers will have a Bermuda lawn or zoysia. And then their neighbor that we're taking care of has a fescue lawn. So what do you think is going to happen eventually over time, especially with that Bermuda lawn right beside a fescue lawn? It's going to creep over. And if our guys aren't blowing off the, the machines before going to, to the yard next to it, mowing the Bermuda first, it's going to be an issue. It's going to what just... Type, hmm? Sorry. What type of grass is fescue? We have tall fescue. It's, I mean, it's a fescue grass, um, like Kentucky 31, um, Kentucky blue. It's going to be in your cooler climates. You're not going to see it down in Florida. Um, okay. Yeah, because yeah, we did the St. Augustine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we're here in the transition zone. We don't have any St. Augustine uh, customers here, but we do have some Bermuda and Zoysia uh, okay. clients. And then down on the coast, we'll see uh, uh, centipede, St. Augustine. Okay. But a lot of zoysia. I love zoysia grass. Um, 
uh, it is, you know, a, a good grass to have, but, you know, I, I'm going to go tall fescue over any of them. But if I had a, you know, if I, if I was lucky enough to have a swimming pool here, you know, I would want a warm season grass around the swimming pool. That just kind of goes hand in hand. But it's kind of hard to beat striping up a tall fescue lawn. Uh, but Bermuda grass, you know, a big problem, uh, you know, for us fighting that. But on the, on the golf course, people love it. On the football fields, people love it. Winter annuals, Carolina geranium. Stems are hairy and reddish. The, uh, the leaves are round and deeply lobed and have long petioles. You'll apply the mulch to smother the seedlings, and that can be done. These guys can be a little hard. You know, if you reach down and hand pull them, they might break off. You may need to take like one of your weeding forks and get underneath it. Uh, but the herbicides are most effective on the small plants. These guys can get pretty big fairly quick and they're gonna be noticed by your customers. Horseweed, also called Mars tail or mare's tail, will grow a long single stem that branches at the top, if not cut, and then can grow up to six feet. Small infestations can be pulled by hand. Larger weeds need to be treated with some type of herbicide. And I swear, I think if you see some of the erosion control seeding companies, you see a lot of this stuff come up with it, with millet and everything else. But, you know, it establishes fast, and it is very invasive. I mean, it's, it's going to take over. But a weed that gets six feet, that ain't, that's not good. Bull thistle, not what you want to pull by hand, but a nasty little guy, coarse and spiny, grows in a flat rosette with a taproot. The branches are hairy and prickly. Uh, it flowers, you know, June through October and then uh, disperses the seeds similar to a dandelion. And you know, the dandelion is an exotic invasive. It was brought over here to the U.S., not native. A lot of our weeds are not native. Broadleaf perennial, the wood sorrel. Small, bushy, yellowish green plant. The stems are slender and the roots uh, at the nodes. The seed pods break open when dry and then they throw seeds as far as six feet. So look how fast that could take over a yard. A couple seasons and it could be covered. If it can throw seeds six feet, you need to hoe it or pull it from the plant beds. Doc, common name for about 20 species of weeds. Uh, it is broadleaf. Broadleaf and curly dock are the most common. It's a low, bunchy, and flat top leaves. Spot treatment of the contact herbicides is preferred. Hand pulling usually breaks off at the taproot. Exactly. Poison ivy. Seen a bunch of that this year. I've been covered up in it a couple times already. Common in the woods, fields, and landscapes. Can climb trees using hairy aerial roots along the stem. Has three shiny green leaves. Produces fruits that are eaten by birds and spread to the landscapes. Also spreads with rhizomes, and you need to cut the vines and spray it with a herbicide. What's the best, what is the best herbicide for that? What are you guys using for that? Uh, I think 2,4-D has, uh, has better results for me on uh, poison ivy. Uh, glyphosate, I mean, it, it works all right, but I think 2,4-D can do a better job. Better on job. Poison ivy. Yeah. Unfortunately, I can look at this stuff and actually be covered in it. All right. So diseases of ornamental plants. All right, the objectives. We're gonna name the four types of pathogens that cause the majority of plant diseases. We'll explain the difference between a protectant and systemic fungicide. And we will define a fungicide resistance and explain how to slow the development of resistance. 
and then we will know the general symptoms associated with common foliar and root diseases. All right, disease management. Prevention is the most important method of disease management. Now, you've probably seen a bunch of disease already this season. Definitely in your turf grasses, and you're probably gonna see it in a lot of your shrubs, just because of the temperatures that we've had and the rain that we've been getting. By the time symptoms appear or become severe, it's often too late to provide effective control. And with the cost of some of these fungicides, man, to be honest with you, it may be just better to go ahead and replace the plant if it's already going to take it over. That gets into um, whether or not, you know, your client wants to spend that money because fungicides definitely, definitely will get expensive. With careful cultural management, most landscape plants can be grown using little to no pesticides. Uh, many factors will cause plant problems with symptoms that will resemble those caused by the plant pathogens. Um, symptoms caused by overwatering, deficiencies, pesticide toxicity, air pollution, and improper plant selection are often blamed on insects, mites, or plant pathogens. And we have those customers that are going to overwater their turf grass. They're going to overwater their plants. Why do they do that? And what's one way we can help ourselves by keeping, their, keeping that homeowner away from the irrigation controller? Why do they want to play with that thing? Because they have it. Because they have it. And they've just spent, you know, several thousand dollars on a new system. And they're mad because the thing comes on at 4 o'clock in the morning when it should. And so they go out there and they start playing with it. And maybe they want their kids to run through it, you know, turn the sprinklers on or whatever. But then they get it all out of kelter. And that thing's just whacked. All the times are changed and everything else. They've even turned the rain sensor off. You drive by, it's pouring down rain, and you see the rotors going in the front yard. It's just a nightmare. That's why I like putting the irrigation controller on the outside of the house and locking it somewhere that the homeowner's not even going to think to find it. You put that thing hanging in the garage, and, and the, the, the father or the husband drives home, man, he sees that playing thing hanging on the wall. And don't ever tell him that you can have an app on your phone to control it. Because they're going to be sitting there doing that. Oh, crazy stuff, man. I can't stand driving by. You know, when I leave here in a little bit, I guarantee you, guarantee you, I will see an irrigation system running tonight when I head over, we head to the house. The problem with that, just like I said, you're going to see some dude standing out there watching his sprinklers run. You see people watering their vegetable plants at night. Uh, you see them watering their shrubs at night. Why does that? Why is that a problem, though? Why is why is it a problem with our shrubs and our turf grasses? It causes fungus. It causes the fungus because we, it does not have a chance to dry before nightfall. Get that cooler temperature. It's going to stay wet. It's going to have wet feet. Next thing you know, you've got big, big problems. That's why you want to water early in the mornings. Let the plants and the turf grass dry off all day give them a chance to dry out before nightfall but diseases can only occur with the presence of a pathogen which is the the the, the problem itself but you got to have the susceptible host you got to have a weak plant and then you got to have favorable environmental conditions and we've had the favorable conditions We've had the hot, hot weather. We've had the rainy, wet days. And we have those clients that like to play with their irrigation controller. Types of pathogens. Fungi, responsible for most plant diseases. Uh, they will cause leaf spots, wilts, dieback, root rots, and cankers. You need a microscope to see them. And they look pretty darn cool underneath the microscope. Powdery mildew and rust are visible without magnification. 
and fungicides are fungicides are applied for the control for most of them. Bacteria, one-celled, causes shoot blights, leaf spots, soft rots, and galls. Once the symptoms are seen, the damage is done, and it's difficult to stop the disease development. He said, cut it out, replace the plant, do what you got to do. Bactericides are often used to control some of the diseases. Viruses, too small to be seen, even with a microscope causes stunting, discoloration of the leaves and the flowers, and malformation of plant tissue, usually introduced to a landscape through other infected plants. Nursery to the nursery. You go and buy plants that's already infected and you put it in the existing landscape, it's gonna happen. Aphids, leaf hoppers, or thrips can spread many of the common plant viruses and no pesticides available for virus control. Some insecticides can control the insects that tra transmit the virus, but that's about all that we can do. Plant parasitic nematodes, they're microscopic round worms. They attack roots, shoots, and leaves and cause root galls, stubby roots, low vigor, discoloration, and decline of the infected plants. Foliar nematodes cause a discoloration of the leaf tissue and infested leaves will drop off. There we have some of the most common root knot nematode, the cyst nematode, stubby root, spiral, sting, ring, and the reniform female and male nematodes. Protectant fungicides. Uh, most pesticides applied to ornamentals are fungicides used to control fungal diseases. The, uh, the bactericides are used to control bacterial diseases, and some are used specifically to treat one disease, while others are a broad spectrum and can treat a variety of pathogens. And probably used more for a preventive situation. But most fungicides are protectants, protecting the plant from the pathogen for a specific period of time. And then the protectants prevent a pathogen from entering the plant once it is on the plant's surface. So, all right, guys, it is uh, 7.53. So if you guys want to take a 10-minute break, we do 50 minutes of instruction, and uh, I'll be back in about 10 minutes. If you want to get something to drink or um, use the restroom or whatever, I'll see you about three minutes after 8. All right, welcome back, guys. 50 more minutes to go. Oh, let's see. Yeah, we read that slide. All right, so when using a protectant, be sure to completely coat the plant's surface. Now, what do we need to do? to make sure that we are completely coating the surface of that plant. We need to calibrate that backpack sprayer if that's what we're using. And that's probably what we're going to use most of the time when doing tree and shrub uh, applications. Yes, we may have a truck sprayer that we may do it or a tank sprayer, but I love doing the backpack. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to find, you're going to have to calibrate uh, that that backpack sprayer. So you're going to have to find a, a similar plant size and you're going to have to uh, calibrate it doing that with just water. Spraying the entire surface the whole time, uh, recording the number of seconds that you're going to use it, and then calculate from that point how much, how much water you're going to need and how much chemical or pesticide that you're going to need for, uh, before doing it. Remember that actively growing plants may need reapplications once new plant tissue has developed. So the plants are in an active growing season. And yes, you're going to have to go back and spray the new uh, foliage that comes out. Heavy rains and even irrigation can wash these protectants off after a period of time. And so you may want to shut down the irrigation system for a little bit. 
if you're going to make a uh, uh, apply a protective fungicide. It's not going to hurt to turn it off. Make sure that it's all dry. Make sure it's on there, and actually give it a few days to actually um, take effect and start working, and then turn the system back on. Systemic fungicides. They're absorbed and translocated within the plant uh, from the site of application to distant tissues. So it's gonna move throughout it. It can prevent development of disease at the site of uptake and in other regions of the plant. And that's why we're using them. It is gonna transport through the, the plant and prevent it from happening at other parts. None can translocate through the entire plant, only translocated upward in the plant's xylem. Local penetrant or local systemic fungicides are absorbed into the immediate area of the application. They have a longer residual activity uh, than protectant fungicides, and they can protect plant tissues such as crowns, roots, and newly formed tissues. With resistance, fungicide resistance, the mode of action is how a fungicide. Can you guys hear me and see me? Let's have somebody say, okay. Let's have somebody say it was messing up. But the mode of action is how a fungicide or a bactericide controls a plant pathogen. And one way that we can prevent resistance is to change our fungicides, change our pesticides. We don't want to use the same one over and over again. A fungus develops resistance if it can no longer be killed by the fungicide and cannot be adequately controlled by that mode of action. So change it up. It's harder for fungi to develop resistance to protectants than systemic fungicides because it affects fungi in multiple ways and then limit the number of applications that we need um, to apply. Fumigants, soil fumigants, again, used to sterilize the soil by killing uh, most fungi, bacteria, insects, nematodes, and weeds. Now, we've had very good luck on our strawberry farm with disease. We rarely, I mean, never really get any disease. But the fumigant that we use is supposed to also control weeds. But you know, we plant, we're getting ready to plant strawberries. We plant them the first, you know, supposed to plant them first, second week in September. It is going to be a little bit later this year, three to four weeks, just because availability of plants. We're going to have to cover them more uh, with a light tarp to get more warmer days to get that longer growing season. But we babysit these plants all winter long. But when we apply these fumigants, it's supposed to knock out weeds too but weeds is something that we fight all the time. Now, that's the only time any fungicide or pesticide is totally used. It's used to, to basically sterilize the soil. We never apply a pesticide to our plants. When the plants are in the ground, it's no more. It's hand pulling. And let me tell you something, it, it, takes, it takes a long time to hand pull two and a half acres of strawberries. We touch each plant you know, two or three times throughout the season as we are weeding the plants. Uh, limited to situations where populations of soil-borne pathogens have reached high levels and susceptible plants can no longer grow there successfully. Uh, is applied as a gas or a liquid. We apply it as a gas uh, and is injected into the soil, immediately covered with plastic, or as granules that are incorporated into the soil followed by irrigation and covered with plastic. We actually have a plastic layer that's got the Talon tanks on the back of the tractor. And so it's fumigating the soil and then like I said, immediately covering it um, uh, with the plastic. And here, you know, you actually see uh, an example of it. This stuff can be highly toxic to humans. Uh, the fumigants are restricted use pesticides, which means, you know, you as an applicator can purchase it, but not the homeowner. Uh, it cannot be applied where plants are growing. And so once we lay the plastic, we're going to have to wait a couple weeks before we can even plant into it. Usually limited to large landscapes that are replanted every year or their high value ornamentals that are being grown. Now, 
unfortunately, we have to do this every single year. People ask us, well, you know, what do you do with the strawberries? Well, we bush hog them and we got a plastic cutter and we go and we cut all the plastic up, pull all the plants up and it's a done deal. And then we plow the fields up over again, do our soil testing and do it every single year. And people ask, well, you know, strawberry is a perennial plant. Yes, but we're not going to get the yield that we're looking for um, as we do when planting them every, planting them over every year. But that's a good, good picture uh, of it. You know, our rows are very smaller. They're not even as wide as this. Uh, we've got enough just for two rows of strawberries on each row. And then we have room that we can drive, uh, you know, the tractor wheels uh, over, over the beds. And we actually got a little mechanical planter or a picker that we roll over it. Leaf spots caused by environmental or caused by pathogens, environmental conditions, cultural practices, and insects. They're circular or ir irregular lesions on the leaves, usually brown, yellow, or reddish. Usually show up on older leaves in warm and humid weather, and they can be caused uh, by a bacteria or a fungi. Nasty stuff looking here. Scabs causes defoliation and blemishes on fruit. It is a dull olive green growth on apples and crab apples. The leaves may turn yellow or reddish and drop prematurely. Infected uh, fruits have circular rough spots on the surface. The fungus uh, overwinters on infected plant material and spores are splashed onto new plant material by rain the next season. And yes, with these crab apples, we have some beautiful ones on campus that were cut down because of it. It's just nasty stuff. And you will see that a lot with your crab apples. Even some of your cherries will drop their leaves because of these guys. Root rot symptoms can be seen on roots and usually through other parts of the plant. The root rot causing fungi are re already present within the soil. Uh, there's that phyto, um, phytoerythria root rot, big problem. You know, when I first got in the business, well, I've been in the business my whole year. I grew up with it with my parents, but I remember them in particular talking a lot about this root rot that kills the roots and the root crown of infected plants. You know, we had to go in and I remember dad talking about it still to this day, you know, replacing hundreds of plants that were infected with this on a new installation that we did. Avoid overwatering and poor drained soils. The infected wood may die at the base of the plant and then the leaves will wilt and then the plant will die suddenly. Nematodes, infestation should be considered whenever a plant species shows a general decline, stunting, or yellowing and browns, uh, bronzing of the foliage. The root rot and poor uh, cultural care causes similar symptoms. Determined by a soil sample, weakened plants from nematode damage will be susceptible to other pests. The foliar nematodes cause areas of discolored tissue between major leaf veins and becomes brown with age and will drop their leaves. Powdery mildew. <clears throat> Most ornamental plants will get this stuff. I mean, it just happens. First signs are patches of white powdery looking fungal colonies on the leaf surface and the stems. Favored by cool nights and high humidity. You know, perfect for North Carolina, guys. Free water on leaf surfaces will minimize the disease. Again, don't water late in the evenings. Infected leaves will become puckered and distorted. And then the uh, new growth is deformed and the buds do not open properly. Blights. Fire blight commonly affects roses, apples, pears, hawthorns, and cotone aster. Now, are you guys still planting any Indian hawthorns? Are you seeing them slowly disappearing from the nurseries and on landscape designs? In the eastern part of North Carolina, they're all gone. I mean, there's no Indian hawthorn. I mean, they're totally all gone. gone. Yep. And that's a shame because that was one of my favorite plants. 
one of my favorites, but you know, it's just nothing we could do about it. Sudden wilting or browning of the shoots, blossoms or fruit shoots appear scorched and then the dead leaves remain attached to the twigs. Cankers may form on the branches in the twigs and overwinter uh, overwinters in the plant tissue and is spread by insects, rain and pruning tools. Pruning tools. That reminds me, are you guys familiar with, um, oh my goodness, totally forgot the name. It was right on the tip of my tongue. Um, Oh my gosh, what was the plant years ago? It was deciduous. It was used as a screening. It was red. Oh my gosh. The red tip. Red tip fatinias. That's it. Man, Lord yeah. of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you know what's funny, man, every once a blue moon, you'll drive through a new neighborhood and you'll see one <laughs> that's like huge. And it was yeah. it's still there because it never got pruned. <laughs> and that was I remember I remember those because my dad had some on both sides of his house and I had to take them out. <laughs> oh, yeah. But man, mm. I loved those plants. Loved them. And uh you know, I, you know for one because it, you know it was a deciduous screen, you know, they they it, but they were still thick. I mean, it was hard to see through them when they dropped all their leaves. Uh, yep. but, you know, they had that apple smell when you cut them. But what it was, you know, we didn't sterilize our pruners you know, from job to job. I mean, it was basically, we took them out ourselves, mm -hmm. um, but still man driving through those neighborhoods and you'll see one that's like, you know, 25 feet tall and you're like, Oh my gosh, there's a red tip fatinia. Yeah. Yep. Even at the, uh, the, the green grow show this past year, there were some fatinias. They had come out with a disease resistant one. So I'm wondering how well that's going to be. Uh, adapted to the to the landscapes if if the architects are going to start using them uh in their plans but it was it was cool seeing those those new baby uh fatinias these uh, guys can also be spread by pollinators once the flowers are infected so the blights are spread by the by the ones taking flight vascular wilts here we see it on tomatoes fungi and bacteria can cause the wilts usually fatal and young plants are killed quickly the older plants may take several years to die it disrupts the vascular system that transports water and nutrients within the plant it's hurting that phloem and xylem tissue turns brown and becomes clogged and the needles or leaves begin to fade and then turn yellow or brown and then they will wilt all right pest of our shade trees All right. So the um the spread of insects and disease is a response to or symptom of stress or weakness within the tree. And you'll see trees that'll just all of a sudden become weak. They'll they'll get a you know a crack in it, you know, either a branch falling off, whatever, but they get that exposed wood and they're just gonna you know, get infested with this stuff. These infested trees may become more susceptible to even wind injury, and the wind damage can expose the inner bark, making the trees susceptible to various insects and disease. And so when faced with a tree problem, ask, is the tree under stress? Can the stress be alleviated? And how can the tree's vigor be restored? Sometimes it may just be too late and you're starting to see you know we had a the largest white oak i think in winston-salem where one of the ones that was used definitely for a lot of wedding pictures over at tanglewood was it last year or even the year before um that the white oak there by the arboretum completely fell had a storm one night come in. I mean, people were, you know, devastated losing that huge white oak. Stress reduction with species selection. There are two types of stress. Stress from human activities and stress caused by natural events. What are some stresses that humans can cause on trees? 
What are some ones that we might see? Uh, I think cotton, you know, some of the limbs, you know, in, like in the summer, hot, you know, summer, I mean, that, that puts a lot of stress on, on the tree. I mean, cotton. Yeah. Yeah. Especially tree topping, you know, going in and cutting them way back. Um, also, maybe not pulling the burlap, you know, away from the trunk of the tree when we plant it maybe not pulling the wire basket back far enough. You know, there's, there's two types of theories on that. Remove the wire basket or leave the wire basket on. I'm in favor of leaving the basket on the tree, but just folding it back enough where it can, uh, you know, still do its thing. But I think we need to keep that native soil and in contact with the roots. Um, parking lots pavement over top of the roots planting a tree in the city that's not an urban tree there's all kinds of human activities the exhaust from the cities the cars pedestrian traffic walking over them and definitely vehicular traffic if it's planted you know on the curb and gutter side in a urban environment so a lot of stresses can be caused just from us on our trees. Natural events, you know, hurricanes, wind damage, thunderstorms, earthquakes. How many of y'all felt the earthquake last week here in the North Carolina area? Kind of crazy, wasn't it? Yep. And so that's got to have an effect. We may not even see the effects on that. Did it damage some roots? Did it knock some tree limbs out of the top? I'm sure there were a lot of, you know, branches that fell out, especially ones that were dying or, you know, dead anyway. And that may open up a wound that's going to cause more infestations. But we got to select the species that are native to our area or ones that we know will grow in a similar climate and similar soil, same water table, and then the same sun and wind exposure. Consider planting pioneer trees. Let's see the next slide on that. So pioneer trees, they're fast growing with a short lifespan. They grow well in hostile environments. Those can be our hawthorns, tree of heaven, honey locusts, cork trees, and many others. Not some of my favorite trees there, but there may be situations that we can do it. Is anybody in here a certified arborist? I always love talking to, to the arborist. I had one in a class in Raleigh back in March, and we had that discussion of leaving the wire basket on or taking the wire basket off. And like ISA is saying, take the basket off now. You know, I don't know what's what are you, what is y'all's take on that? Because that is a cultural practice. And when it comes to doing that, because I'm seeing it a lot of, you know, a lot of landscape architects saying remove the wire basket. And it's kind of hard to guarantee a one-year warranty when you remove this wire basket. What's y'all's take on that? Leave the basket and just cut the top part where it's exposed, pull back the burlap as much as we can. Exactly, exactly. Cause I've had it too, where we plant trees and then the customer might want to move them or somewhere else. And once you take it out, that thing will just fall apart. If you go trying to mess with it again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But unfortunately, you know, when you get a set of plans and you, you bid these jobs and if you don't read the specifications, which is a whole nother set of documents itself, I mean, you can have a set of specifications that are, you know, this thick, you know, two telephone books. And if you don't find where it says about the wire baskets, you could be in trouble. A friend of mine planted a bunch of trees in a park, he planted over, it was like 150 trees in a new park. And got all the trees planted. The landscape architect shows up for one in a truck. You don't see many LAs driving a truck, but gets out with a shovel, rake, pulls them pine needles back, digs around it and says, Hey, you still got to wire a basket on these trees. He's like, yeah, we do that. He's like, but you didn't read my specifications. Did you? 
Specs said remove the wire basket. So what do you think they had to do? Pull them up, remove the wire basket, plant them again. That tree went through double stress. Being dug the first time in the field, being planted, and then having to be dug up, remove the wire basket, and then they still had to guarantee the ones that they lost for one year. So always read the specs because they can throw some sneaky stuff in there. Drainage. The top of the root ball should be elevated one to two inches above the soil grade when the tree is first planted. You don't want it to build up all that soil around it and, and you know, get, develop a root flare of soil and mulch and everything. And plus you don't want it to have the wet feet. You wanna keep that water from collecting around the base of the trunk. And if the trunk is kept moist, it can become susceptible to these disease causing pathogens. Same thing, you know, mulch piled up around it. It needs to have plenty of air getting through it. That's why I'm a big proponent of pine needles on some of these new installation jobs because it's going to let more air get up against the trunks than actual mulch. Staking. Trees develop the strongest resistance to wood damage if the ties to the stakes permit some movement of the young trunk when the wind blows. You do not want to allow the trunk to rub against the bark, cause an injury to the bark. Bark injuries can be inviting to beetle damage. Pruning. Improper pruning is a major cause of tree decay and can trigger an insect attack. Look at everything that's happening uh, uh, with, you know, the crepe murdering. And you're starting to see them actually, the same individuals that pruned our crepe myrtles back like that. They're going in and doing their willow oaks. They're going in and doing their white oaks. They're going and they're tree topping all of these trees. It's illegal in some cities. Not, not every municipality will, um, you know, fine the customers for doing that. But, you know, we've heard of the so-called tree police that are out there when you go and do that. And I think they should do that. It is very, very harmful uh, to the trees and uh, it just looks just looks ugly. The tree collars is a tree's natural defense against insects and disease. The collar forms that chemical barrier that uh, wall off the decay organism. So you know cutting it flush up against the tree is not a good thing to do if you do have to remove one of those branches. So when it is pruned flush to the trunk the collar is removed and the tree becomes more susceptible to these disease organisms. There's as many new startup arborists in this area as there are startup lawn care companies. Soil aeration. Roots need small empty spaces within the soil where they can release carbon dioxide and obtain oxygen. A mulch of organic material should be placed over these areas within the drip line where human traffic passes through them. And so, Yes, every year that the tree grows, we need to widen our mulch beds. We need to make them bigger. We need to have it underneath the tree line or the drip line. Weed control. Trees can be harmed by herbicides applied to the lawn and ground nearby. These herbicides can volatize in warm temperatures and rise to damage the tree leaves. Use organic mulches for alternative pest control around the shade tree bases and then control weeds through proper lawn care, aeration, proper mowing height and frequency. Proper cultivation, selection, deep infrequent irrigation and the use of slow release fertilizer. Like I said, we're getting ready to do plugging and seeding. We're gonna be dumping out some, uh, you know, 18, 24, 12, some high nitrogen stuff. It's gonna increase, you know, aphids. They love that nitrogen. And so if we've got trees that are damaged or whatever, it can be susceptible to that. Fertilizer. The overuse of nitrogen fertilizer can encourage the growth of the aphids and scale populations. We can control this by using slower release fertilizers. And if planting beneath the tree, be sure the plant's fertilizer needs do not interfere with the well being of the shade tree. There is one tree that you can't plant anything underneath. Of. What is that? It's going to take up all the nutrients. What's that? The, the walnut tree, I believe. 
walnut or the hickory, one that you can't plant anything underneath it. It'll kill them dead. Uh, protection against road salt. Salt can burn the trees during spring thaws. Uh, the leach salt from infected, uh, affected areas in early spring. Avoid placing removed snow near tree root zones and use sand or sawdust as a salt alternative. It's kind of hard to do that. Um, we used to do a ton of snow removal. We haven't, we haven't done any in the last, well, for one, we haven't had much snow. Um, but we used to do a ton of it. And that was always an issue. And that was always in, stated in the contract about having to go back and kind of get the salt up around sidewalks and stuff instead of blowing it back in the salt and the uh, shrub beds. And you'll see other companies that don't practice that having these issues. They'll actually um, have to go in and dig these plants out and replant them because uh, of the, the salt that they're using. And there are some safer chemicals that you can actually get, no burn and stuff like that, that will actually protect um, these plants. Protection against natural stressors, unusual cold, periods of extreme dryness and heat, and successive years uh, of attack by non-native insects can reduce the tree vigor. Young trees can be wrapped to protect from the extreme cold weather. And then uh, these trees will benefit from deep irrigation during extreme dry times. Whitewashing the, the bark of young trees helps prevent sunburn, which also invites insects and diseases. Now, with our trees and with our shrubs, I prefer using a drip irrigation where we can let it run for several, several hours and actually control the number of gallons um, that are needed on these trees. It's kind of hard to do that with a, you know, rotor or pop-up because you're, you're not going to be able to run it for so long. For one, you're going to get runoff. That drip is actually going to seep into the soil and actually uh, do it. And with the emitters that we can get, we can control exactly how many gallons per hour per day uh, that that tree needs to get, you know, from the time we plant it till, you know, stepping it back as the tree gets older. With drip irrigation is the only way to go with trees and shrubs. Understanding natural um, cycles of pest abundance, year-to-year -year changes in the weather and in the abundance of predators, peritosoids, and pathogens that feed upon the pest have a significant impact on pest population changes. Now, that word there, peritosoids, what's the difference between a parasite and a peritosoid? You know, very similar, but what is the main difference between the two? One needs a host. Yeah, well, yeah. And one, which one's going to kill the host? Your peritosoid okay. will, will kill it, will kill it dead. A parasite, it's going to, you know, knock it in the rear a little bit and slow it down and will cause some damage. But the peritosoid is actually going to kill the host species. And that's what you have these parasitic wasp and stuff for that's used on the, the aphids. It kills the host. The, the thing with peritosoids, we don't know much ab about them uh, in the landscape industry. For one, their botanical names are too long. They're too small to see, and there's no common names for them. We just don't use them much. They're going to be used mainly in greenhouse uh, production and stuff like that, but they will kill the host. And they're only used on Pacific um, – Pacific host, they're not, they're not multi-host. So they're grown just for a particular host. Some years popula uh, pest populations may thrive, while other years the populations may crash. Anybody, grow, anybody growing any tomatoes out there? Anybody got a garden growing, doing in tomatoes? Are you seeing any tomato hornworms? Tomato hornworms, you know, when they overwinter and they're in the soil and stuff, they need a dry winter. They're not going to thrive in the ground with a wet winter. Well, we've had pretty two wet winters the past year. So we've actually seen fewer and fewer of these tomato hornworms in the garden. 
and it was funny, Laura, she was actually at the uh, pet store the other day and they were selling these tomato hornworms. You know, they get, you know, pretty big. And she said they were selling them like $5 a piece. They had like three in a cup for like $15 that people are actually feeding their, their lizards at home with that stuff. And she's like, well, you know, you could probably go and find them in your garden uh, if we had a drier winter. Avoid preventative sprays when possible. Learn to recognize pests and their thresholds. Threshold is a term that we're going to have to discuss with our client. Some clients just aren't going to care. They're not going to want to spend that money to get rid of that pest. They're, they're going to be okay with it. And you'll see more of that in lawn care because we've got clients that will absolutely fire us on the spot if we have one weed show up in their turf grass. And then we have clients that like, hey, just mow, blow, and go. We don't care. We don't want you to spray. All we want is mowed. We're not that particular on how our yard looks. Now, it's kind of hard to have those as customers, but, you know, we take everybody's money, and you're going to actually work for them. Their threshold is a lot lower than the neighbor down the street that will fire you for one weed in the yard. You got you to gotta help determine that and find out what is their threshold. Attempt to suppress pests using the least toxic method possible, and then spot treat when using toxic materials. I love spot treatments, and that is a big, big term used in integrated pest management. And even when it comes to the lawn care side, I don't like mixing my chemicals all together in one tank. I don't want to put out my pre, I don't want to put a liquid pre-emergent with a liquid fertilized and a liquid broadleaf herbicide. I want to push, I want to push my fertilize and I want to spray or spot spray my herbicides. For one, these things are expensive. And if you're putting a broadleaf herbicide over an entire property that doesn't need it, you're wasting money and you're applying a pesticide where it's not needed, which is against the label. And then plant diversely. Look at some of the new plants that are coming out you know, that are being genetically grown, that are fight, you know, that are pest resistant, disease resistant. We got to start using those. And when it comes to irrigation, we need to plant plants with the same water needs as its neighbors. We don't need to plant a shrub that could be used in xeriscape gardening next to one that needs to be watered every single day. We've got to learn learn our plant material. Accidentally introduced shade tree pests, uh, plants, insects, and pathogens that are introduced have the ability to become invasive due to the lack of suppression from competing plants and often the lack of predators and pests that affect these pests. Imported pests can be monitored and sometimes controlled, but usually will never be eradicated. And sometimes we don't necessarily want to eradicate an entire pest species. Why is that? We're going to run off the natural predators. And if we run off the natural predators, we could actually have a bigger problem down the road. We got to leave something for the good guys to, to, to feast on. All efforts must be made to keep these pests from becoming invasive. Biological controls for accidentally introduced insects. Search for natural enemies for the pest where the, where the pest originated from. The use of a pest natural enemies is the most important, cost-effective, and underfunded effort for suppression of exotic species. The most serious shade tree pests. Most pest problems occur in response to improper species selection or tree management, environmental stress, or human activities. Very little can be done to control the exotic pests. Sap suckers, mites are triggered by pesticide use against other pests. This may be a symptom of a lack of water or other stresses. Aphids may be a symptom of excess nitrogen fertilizer. 
can be attached to overly pruned plants. Pesticides used to kill the aphids, natural predators, may cause an infestation. These overly pruned plants, guys, what happens when we prune a plant? What does the plant automatically do in response to pruning? It's going to put out new growth. And the aphids are going to live and eat the new foliage. They're not going to go after the, the harder established foliage. So anytime we prune plants, we're making them susceptible, susceptible to the aphids. And that's why we got to prune out all these new sucker growths that come on the trees. And every time we cut back crepe myrtles, we're going to increase the chance of aphids because they're going to send out all of these water sprouts and suckers. Scales, they can be triggered by pesticides used against other pests, excess nitrogen, or by environmental stressors, prune out the severely infested limbs. Leaf chewers, we got our caterpillars, beetles, bark beetles, and our trunk borers. And then implementing the IPM concept for urban shade trees. It helps sort through the pest problems quickly. And the first part of the IPM plan is to identify the actual pest. Can be used within small and large landscapes. And it is the ideal approach to tree pest management. Which, who are the first people to come up with integrated pest management or IPM? What was it designed for? For, developed for agriculture, the farmers, and they jumped all over it because they do not want to spend the thousands of dollars that it takes to make a pesticide application on a farm. So IPM was first developed for agriculture. And the whole process of that is these farmers have to de determine their threshold. And once it reaches a certain threshold or level, they need to make that application because if it gets any worse, it may be better just to let the crop go than to make the application because the application is going to cost them too much money. They don't want to spend any more money to get rid of the pest because the yield from the crops after the application is still not going to be worth the application. And that actually uh, comes from the Gardener's Guide to Common Sense Pest Control. Took a lot of notes out of that. That was a textbook I used in college. I still use it some at the uh, the college today. But go ahead and stop the actual share. I know we finished up uh, what about seven minutes early. You guys got any questions or or comments or things that you are seeing in the field today? Your experience, what's going on out there? Like I know, because we're all over different areas of the state. We're seeing different, you know, things probably. So what are some of the uh, insects or diseases that you guys are seeing out there now this time of year? Anybody having a lot of problem with brown patch in the turf this year? Not much? Yes. <laughs> Who said yes? I, mean, I, can't, I can't see everybody. Jeff, Jeff Bullock. Oh, okay, let's see if I can move this. Yeah, it's hard to fit everybody in the screen here, but what part of the area are you from, Jeff? Uh, Hickory, North Carolina. Oh, okay. You didn't happen to know um, the tree farmer up here, would you? Mm. Christmas tree guy? Um, there's several. Daniel, uh, oh shoot, what's Daniel's last name? Guthrie. Yeah, Daniel Guthrie. Guthrie. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yep. Any other comments, questions, or expertise that you guys are seeing out in the field? Has anybody, um, had problems with a fungicide spraying fungicide on yards um with a brown patch and the uh, yards turn a lot browner 
Turn up. I hadn't heard that. No. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Were you doing a preventative or, or were you doing the full rate? It was a full rate. Full rate? Mm hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Did you call, did you call okay. a tag agent or? No, I've not. Anybody got a response to that or? What chemical do you use? Uh, that's what I was, I was here trying to think of it. Um, uh, I saw so, something online where another uh, landscaper did the same thing and he was have he, he had the same problem, but I don't know. I can't remember what, what fungicide it was. It was was uh, it a granular or a liquid? It, tip and pour. it was a liquid. It was a liquid. I didn't hear that. Yeah. yeah. That's the first time I'd, and I'm not, I'm not for certain if the, uh, if the customer didn't spray something on there too. <laughs> that's pro that, that's probably the issue, man. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I have a feeling that may have been what happened. Yep. But I got the blame. <laughs> <laughs> Question Sorry. about the fungus. Mm -hmm. With with the fungus, uh, do you guys use fungicide or you guys put potassium on it to dry it out? It's just a fungicide. Yeah, same here. Because I know there's one company I used to work for like a couple of years ago. They used to have us put down some potash to dry the area out and then they'll double back maybe like two two to three weeks later and add fungicide. But isn't that like using too many products? Like, especially now when you're on your own and wasting money. Yeah. Um, we, we've never done that. No. Like I said, when it comes to wasting money, definitely don't want to do that. Okay. Any other questions? Got about two more minutes, or we could probably end this early. I know it's dinner time. Dinner time for me, anyway. We never <laughs> eat till 9, 9.30. Well. Guys, the way this will work, tomorrow, Laura will uh, upload these rosters. Um, it's taking the Department of Ag. I don't know. The last ones I've got up in like five to seven days. So if you hadn't seen it, apply to your license, you know, within a week, you know, give us a call. Um, but we've got the roster and we submit it. And she does the first thing she does when she comes in in the morning is go ahead and get these credits uh, uploaded to the Department of Ag's website. So, you know, if you guys have any questions or concerns, you know, my email's ejones at turfteacher.com. Uh, and my uh, cell phone's 336-414. 9719. You guys feel free to call me or email me anytime. But again, E Jones at turfteacher.com uh, or 336 414 9719. It's, um, you will be doing these another uh, next next Tuesday. Yeah, we're going to be doing them uh, every uh, every Tuesday night until uh, probably September 30th. Okay. Great. Sounds good. Eric, we appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. You guys take care. Thank you. Thank yes, you, sir. Eric. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye.